Hey everybody, Johnny here. In this video, we're going to take a look at the different types of field inputs that are available to you in Blender 3.0 Beta. The field inputs are found in several different places in the Add menu, but once you understand why they're placed where they are, it'll be pretty easy to find them. The first few we're going to look at are under the Input menu. You will notice that the menus have all been subdivided. The general rule of thumb is that the top section is for actions or static values, the second section is for field inputs, and then if there's a third section, like in the curve menu, it's for setting field outputs. So under the input menu, we only have field inputs in the second section. Currently for Blender 3.0, there will be five available in the input menu. Let's take a look at them. First we have ID. The ID is a stable unique identifier for each point of our attribute. When dealing with static objects, like say this icosphere, the ID will line up with the index of each point. Where the ID becomes important is when you're using a randomized node of some sort. In this case, the ID will stay the same even if the points get moved around. One of the new features that comes along with fields is the ability to view the values of fields. We can do that with a viewer node. If we plug in a field into the value and then plug the source geometry into the geometry and then in our spreadsheet change the mode to viewer node, we'll see the values of that field in the viewer column. Next, let's take a look at the index. Like I said previously, many times the index and ID are the same, unless you're working with a node that randomizes positions. The index will line up with the row number in the spreadsheet. Next, we have the normal. I'll go ahead and connect the normal to my viewer. As you can see, the viewer didn't change to a vector input, so it's still just showing a single float value which isn't correct for a normal, because as you can see, the normal value is outputting purple, which is a vector. I'm gonna delete this viewer, and then control shift click on my normal node. This generates a viewer node with the correct input socket. I'll connect in my geometry, and now we can see my viewer showing my normal vectors. These normal values are the values you would see if you go into edit mode and enable vertex normals. The normal is the unit vector value of each of these points, represented by these blue lines. We can use the normal value to push points in and out in the direction that they're facing. Next, we have the position input. This one is pretty self-explanatory. It just contains the position at each point of my geometry. And finally, we have input radius. Since my current geometry is a mesh, it's not going to have a radius value. But since more than one type does have a radius value, that being curves and point clouds, it's in the input menu. So I'll go ahead, so I'll add a curve primitive so that you can see what's going on here. So I'll add a curve primitive so that you can see what's going on with radius. So in the viewer, we can see that each point of this Bezier segment has a radius of one. If we were to plug the radius into a mesh geometry like this, we'd see that our viewer would just show us zero for the radius because a mesh doesn't have radius data. So those are the five general inputs. All of our object types have one or more of these input types, generally position, index, and ID. Next, if we look under the mesh menu, we'll see three sections. We have our mesh operations, our mesh field input, and our mesh field output. There's only one mesh field input that goes solely along with meshes and that's the is shade smooth. So currently we see on this mesh that is shade smooth is off for all of the points. If I were to edit this mesh, select some faces and then choose shade smooth, we would see that the corresponding indices from the mesh have been marked shade smooth. This data also propagates down to edges and faces. Next, I'll add a curve object we can work with. Going to the Curve menu, we have all of our curve operations and then our curve inputs. There are quite a few. The Curve Handle position gives us access to the left and right curve handles. Next is Curve Parameter. I'm going to go ahead and subdivide this curve a couple of times. And now, when I plug in my Curve Parameter and hook up to the Factor, we see these five values. These five values are the percentage along the curve that that point currently is. And that's per spline. So if I take this curve and duplicate it, so now this curve has two splines, we'll see that point zero, which is here, 
is at 0% of this spline, and then on up through 1, which is 100% of that spline. And then here we have 0.5, which is at 0 of the second spline all the way through 100% of the second spline. If I were to move this point, which is 0.6, closer to the first point, we would see that 0.6 is now at 0 0.088, whereas 0.1 was at 0.213. This point is much further along this curve than this point is along this curve. We can of course use that in a lot of different situations to control what's happening along the length of our splines. The second input, length, gives the same information, except it's showing you the actual length along that spline. You can think of the length as the factor being multiplied by the total length of each spline. Next we have curve tangent. Curve tangent is a vector, and this vector lines up like this along each point of our curve. After curve tangent, we have curve tilt. Curve tilt will show us the tilt value at each point of our curve. One thing to note, if you're using the side panel to enter tilt, it's entered in degrees. However, in the viewer, this will be shown in radians. After tilt, we have endpoint selection. Endpoint selection gives us a Boolean field, where start points and endpoints are returned as true and the rest are not. One additional thing we can do is set how many start points and how many endpoints that we want returned. So if I wanted the first two points at the beginning of each and none of the endpoints, I could set the start size to two and the end size to zero. And here, zero and one are marked true and five and six are marked true. Next, we have handle type selection. Handle type selection will return true whenever the handles at a given point or we can just say just the left or just the right, or both, are set to a specific type. For instance, if I mark this as vector, you'll see that currently none of the handle types are vector. If I go in and take this point and press V twice to mark it as vector, you'll see now that point 0.7 is true. The next input is is spline cyclic. Neither of these splines are marked as cyclic currently, so all of these are returning as false. If I come to my side menu and mark this spline as cyclic, you'll see now that points 5 through 9 are marked true. And if I go to the spline view, you'll see that spline 0, which is the bottom one, is not cyclic, and the top one is. The next input is spline length. Spline length simply returns the total length of each spline. And as you can see here, this does take into consideration if the spline is marked as cyclic. If we go back to the points domain, we'll see that the control points reflect the total length of the spline that they're currently on. And finally, for splines, we have spline resolution. So here, if I change the active spline to five, this top spline is now a resolution of five and the bottom one is still a resolution of 12. So those 15 inputs are what you have to work with right now with fields. This exposes quite a bit of information to you. Of course, there are other ways of getting data into our node trees, and we'll talk about that in a future video. And we'll talk about how we can use this information to make some interesting effects. As always, I hope this video was helpful to you, and I hope you learned something. But most of all, I hope it inspires you to make something awesome. So until next time, I'll catch you later.